the dugongs of Moreton Bay worldwide are considered the largest population close to a major city. So where people are and where people are in large numbers, dugongs tend to decline. So there was a very strong need for regional data from this population. So how do you tackle the problem of getting samples from live dugongs? Wearing workplace issued health and safety rugby helmets, <laughs> we have two primary jumpers that jump from the top of front of the boat and their job is to try and secure the tail fluke. We then have two secondary jumpers that dive into the water and try and secure the pectoral flippers. Then the team as a whole holds the animal up near the surface. Mermaids have appeared for centuries, going back to 1000 BC in folklore of many countries the world over. And they take on various names from mermaid to siren to sea nymphs to the Nereids. And there's something about it that's half human living under the sea that really intrigues us land dwellers. And so I'm going to start here with this pretty sensational <laughs> TV show. Has anyone seen this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you haven't seen it, this here is the cover of what was a fictional documentary that aired on Animal Planet in 2012. And it speculated on the real life existence of mermaids. <laughs> its deceit created a lot of debate and controversy, and it even prompted Noah to have to release a statement to assure people that there was no evidence of aquatic sea people. <laughs> this show and its sequel are ranked as the most watched telecast on the Animal Planet Network. It was watched by millions. Now it does sit a little uneasy with me that this strongest rating for what is a channel dedicated to zoology is on a mythical creature. But the truth is, people can't get enough of mermaids and it's really fascinating. And I'm really happy to actually even talk on this subject here in Boston because you guys actually are also involved in one of the very first hoaxes of mermaids. Going back to the mid-1800s, a Bostonian showman by the name of Moses Kimball acquired what was thought to be a mermaid specimen and he got it from a ship captain in town. He then leased that specimen to a circus guru by the name of P.T. Barnum. So some people have heard of that guy. P.T. Barnum knew that the specimen was a fake, but he also realized that it doesn't matter. People just need to believe. And so what he did was he went about a very elaborate showcase to try and deceive people. And he used the media at the time which is, of course, print. So he printed up a lot of advertisements and pamphlets, like this one up here, all of it showing a beautiful looking mermaid, very alluring. So when people paid to go in and see the show and see the mermaid, this is what they got. <laughs> this thing is half monkey, half fish stitched together. It's mummified and it's quite <laughs> gross. They called them the Fiji mermaids because the spin was that it came from the Fiji Islands, which is not true. It was actually um, made by um, artisanal craftsmen. Some of them come from Japan, some of them come from Indonesia. And there's a bunch of them around the world. So you too can see Barnum's Mermaid because right here in Boston, at the Peabody Museum in Harvard, they have two specimens. And this one is the best looking one. <laughs> So thankfully today, we're much better at fabricating a much more attractive mermaid. So we're all familiar with these two. Back in the ancient times, it was actually the mermaids luring men into the sea. These two have it a little bit reversed, but they're probably one of the most influential mermaids in our modern culture. That is next to one other mermaid that four million of us every single day 
buy our coffee from. <laughs> so this here is Melusine and she is exhibited on the logo and she's known as the twin-tailed siren, which leads us into the real sirens. These animals here make up the order of Sirenia. So there's four species. So there's the manatees, of which there's three species and one subspecies, which is the Florida manatee, and that's one of the West Indian manatees. And the dugong is also part of Order Serenia, but it's in a separate family. It's quite distinct from the manatees. They're a really interesting group. So they're a marine mammal, but they're actually not very closely related to the other marine mammals. They're actually more closely related to elephants. And this weird little guy, the rock hyrax. So the dugong stands alone in its distinctiveness, but there was one other member of family Dugonidae that went extinct in modern times, and that's this impressive beast. So this is a stellar sea cow, and I want to take this in because I actually did the mathematics to try and size this up to be real life. Stellar sea cow lived in the North Pacific. It was a slow moving um, um, sea cow that fed on um, the seaweeds of that area. It was first documented in science by George Wilhelm Stella. And within 27 years of its being recorded in European science, it went extinct. And that was because it was hunted by the fur traders in that region. So 27 years from existence to extinction. So that there gives you some idea as just to how vulnerable these animals are. So they are linked to this mermaid mythology and most of that is really just based on their body form. So it's a stretch, but sailors from bygone eras, if you can imagine you've been at sea for years, in the sun, <laughs> extreme isolation, women were not allowed on the boat, and rum involved. <laughs> but mostly if they would have seen these animals, they probably would have just seen brief glimpses at the surface and then disappearing. I really like talking about Serenians to American audiences because you guys are really familiar with the Florida manatee. And there's a couple of really key differences between the two species. There's a lot of similarities, but there's some key differences. So first off, the dugong is entirely marine whereas the manatee will occasionally go into fresh water or live in estuarine habitats. Physically, the big one, dugongs are more streamlined and they have this fluked tail. So those two characteristics sort of go with them being more marine, so they're a lot more swift and ocean going. Whereas manatees have a very broad paddle shaped tail and they're a little bit more portly. The skin of the dugong is not like the skin of a dolphin. It actually has sparse hairs all across it. And they're almost like bristles. Every two centimeters, you'll get a bristle. The manatee also has these hairs, but they're a lot finer. And the skin of the manatee is more similar to an elephant. And these two species also have some really cool traits that extend from their sort of common ancestry with elephants. Dugongs have tusks. These erupt in sexual maturity in the males but also some of the older females also have these tusks. And the manatee has a really cool little trait left over from their ancestry, and that's toenails. And these toenails look exactly like the toenails you would draw if you were to draw an elephant foot. So, as an Australian, it's a rare sight to see a dugong, even though we have them around a lot of our coastline. So most people have never seen one, or even heard of their existence. So it's quite different to here, whereas the Florida manatee here is very well promoted. Most people have either seen one, it's on a marine calendar at home, or it's on a postage stamp. Dugongs lack a little bit in, um, in their PR. To show you this, this here is a picture on the main road heading to my parents' house. So my family lives in Brisbane, it's on the outer suburbs, so it's quite coastal and we have dugongs in our water. So this here is a 
clearly a marine mural to try and promote the marine environment. You've got bottlenose dolphins, fantastic humpbacks, and Florida manatees. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can see the gum trees there. This is definitely Australia. But it doesn't stop there. The other marine mural in my backyard is this one here on the side of the female toilets. Again, you can see the gum trees. This is actually on a small island, so it's surrounded by dugongs. And you've got the Florida manatee there. They've even gone to the trouble of drawing in the toenails. <laughs> but probably what is the most saddest example is that there is one tour operator that will take people out to try and see dugongs. And right there on the side of the boat is a Florida manatee. <laughs> these are so common that I actually collect these, and I call them duggeties. <laughs> the reverse is a little bit harder to find, but you can find them. So this here is a picture from an American textbook. It's talking about American mammals and their behavior. On the blue strip there to the left, you can even see the word beaver. And it's talking about the Florida manatee, and that there is a picture of a dugong. It's a little bit more subtle because you're looking at the head end, but believe me, that is a dugong. So these, they're rarer, mangongs. <laughs> So the dugong is a really fascinating animal. It's, you don't need to know too much Latin to be a dugong biologist, dugong, dugong. They're three meters or nine foot in length and they can weigh up to about 600 kilos. Their lifespan is thought to be about 70 years and they've estimated that based on their tusks. So the tusks have growth rings just like a tree does so you can count those rings. So I would argue that dugongs are up there with one of the most unique marine mammals. Now I have to put the word most in brackets just so I don't disrespect my New England aquarium colleagues. But they are really unique. They are the only surviving member of the family Dugonidae, so they have their own branch after losing the Stella seeing cow. And they're the only herbivorous marine mammal that is strictly marine. So this counts out the manatees because they will go into fresh water. So being a mammal in the marine environment is energetically difficult because you have to try and maintain your own internal body heat. Now there is a reason why dolphins eat fish. It's a high protein food source. So to switch to something like the herb like vegetation is a lot more uh, difficult to survive. So they have to eat a lot of seagrass and seagrass is nutritionally poor at that. And because seagrass is so nutritionally poor, there's actually very few vertebrates that feed on it. So there's the dugong and the green sea turtle as the larger invertebrates. Dugongs have a very wide distribution. So in the Atlantic, you can see that that's manatee territory. But the dugong has a very wide distribution that goes right across the Indo-Pacific. It covers about 40 countries. Out in the east, you have from Vanuatu heading all the way over to the east of Africa. In the north, they go all the way up to Okinawa, Japan, and down to Australia. But throughout much of this distribution, dugongs are really relic or extinct populations. Australia is really the stronghold for dugongs globally. So we have a really big responsibility to look after our populations. And so their status is vulnerable by IUCN and that's you know, a global level, whereas country by country or location, you will get extinctions. They have a number of threats. Dugongs are actually, and they still remain, a very important protein source for many remote indigenous communities. But these days, uh, the biggest um, and most enduring and pressing threat to dugongs is large-scale habitat de degradation as a result of pollution runoff or urban activities and developments. So when I came on to do my research, one of the things I wanted to try and contribute to was to try and understand the life history and population biology of the dugong. 
It's important to try and understand these because you need to know how your population can recover from decline. So it's almost the alternate from documenting mortalities to actually seeing like what is the capability of these animals to recover. So my topics sort of in cover, cover things like how many mature animals do we have? How many pregnant females do we have? How many calves are born each year? Dugongs are notoriously difficult to study for these reasons. They are air breathers, but when they come to the surface, it's very limited and discrete surfacing, and this is kind of their hallmark. They also tend to be found in very turbid or murky waters. You can't distinguish individuals. They don't have a dorsal fin like some like dolphins do, which is what a lot of population biologists will use for identification, or any distinct color colorations, so you can't really visually easily distinguish them apart. It's also really hard to split up the sexes. Even though a mature male will have tusks, they're hidden under a large lip, so you don't see them very easily. And they can be found in very large herds, so you can find small numbers of them or you can get herds of up to 200. So they're very, very challenging. When you do see them at sea, this is sort of what you get to see if you're lucky. So there's three dugongs in that picture. They're about 10 metres away. It's flat, calm conditions and you can hardly see them. The boats on the horizon are much more easily seen. So one of the very important methods for dugong research is aerial surveys. And these have been conducted in about 20 countries around the world. And it's a very important source of finding out not only where the dugongs actually are, but also to try and get a count of abundance. The main difficulty with aerial surveys is that they are prone to observer bias. So a lot of the models to try and come up with an estimate take in a lot of probability estimates, such as um, clustering, you know, are you seeing a herd or single individuals? What were the conditions like? Because as soon as it gets murky, you're not going to see them. In terms of reproduction, this sort of method will allow you calf counts, but it's very limited. You're not going to learn anything about the males and they do actually contribute to the population. Not only that, you could probably see behaviour, such as breeding behaviour, but it's been reported in very few cases. So necropsy has been a really important source. So carcass analysis allows you to actually look inside the animal and to have a look at the gonads, so the reproductive organs. And under histology, you can get a lot of information about the maturity of the animal. For females, you can have a look at placental scars and get some idea of how many previous calves calves they've had. However, the main challenge with this is that you're working with dead animals, so to try and get these animals is very, very difficult and challenging in salvaging them. However, researchers have done their best with this technique, and so a lot of what we know actually has come off the necropsy record. So one of the very first studies was in the mid-80s off Townsville by Helene Marsh. She's been researching dugongs for many years. She was able to take advantage of the fact that the Queensland government had set up a shark net control program to try and protect its bathers. In the process of that, they managed to entangle about 250 dugongs over 20 years. So Helene was able to get access to those and use, use those um, those dugong carcasses to try and get some of the very early estimates. So her estimates were that dugongs matured somewhere between 220 centimetres and 250 centimetres, and this was likely to be about nine or ten years of age. Another study took advantage of indigenous hunting. So they worked with the communities to try and get the gonads after the hunt, and the data that came off that was a little bit different to what Helene saw. So the maturity was a little bit more protracted, 11 to 15 years. And the size class was about 230, which probably sits in the middle of um, Marsh's data. Another study from the middle of the Torres Strait, which has very lush seagrass beds, found that dugongs were maturing really early at 190 centimetres. So that is very, very small for a dugong. And the age of those animals was about six to seven years. 
So this is kind of where I come in. So I wanted to sort of improve on this data. First off, I wanted to get larger sample sizes because if you're working with carcass analysis, it's biased for many reasons, mostly because it's very difficult to get hold of the specimens. So you've got restricted sizes. And most of those studies have very small size, size, sample sizes for the pubital range, which is really a tricky one to try and uh, distinguish out. Not only that, but carcass analysis is often biased temporally and spatially. So temporally because sometimes some of the communities will heart, like, target particular size classes, and then spatially because you're restricted to where those communities are hunting dugongs for food. And that's a problem because that typically is in tropical waters. So I wanted to try and extend our knowledge of dugongs down to the lower latitudes, to the subtropics, because dugongs actually span quite, um, quite a width of the earth, from 26 degrees north down to 27 degrees south. It's important to get some parameters at the extreme because subtropical dugongs are likely to be more influenced by the seasons, which has a big part to play if you're a vegetarian and your plant that you're eating is susceptible to seasonal fluxes, which seagrasses are. The next thing I wanted to do was I wanted to do it in live dugongs. So have a look at a real live living population, not obtain samples after the fact. So this is where I come in, in Brisbane, in Moreton Bay, at the southern limit of the dugongs distribution. The Moreton Bay population is thought to be close to 1,000 dugongs. It's subtropical and they're resident. They're there year round. It's also close to a major city and that's the city of Brisbane. Moreton Bay, the dugongs of Moreton Bay worldwide are considered the largest population close to a major city. So where people are and where people are in large numbers, dugongs tend to decline. So there was a very strong need for regional data from this population. So how do you tackle the problem of getting samples from live dugongs? Wearing workplace issued health and safety rugby helmets. <laughs> we have two primary jumpers that jump from the top of front of the boat and their job is to try and secure the tail fluke. We then have two secondary jumpers that dive into the water and try and secure the pectoral flippers. Then the team as a whole holds the animal up near the surface. This technique was actually developed by Janet Langan and her team over several years. And it was originally a concept for sea turtles. So they have really perfected it and mastered it for dugongs. What it means is that the animals don't need to be pulled out, out of the water in terms of sampling. So there's no nets involved as well. And it allows scientific sampling to be formed very rapidly in quick succession. And we can sample a lot of dugongs and there's no biases in which dugongs we choose. So this technique has allowed us in under five minutes, we can dive underneath the animal and have a look at the sex. We can get a length measure to see what the growth rate of the population is. We can get a very small scraping off the skin. This gives us genetics, so we have individual identification. It also allows us to look at the population genetic and gene flow. We can get girth measures, multiple girth measures. These will give us an idea of body condition. We can have a look under the, the lip and lift the labial lip to find out if it's tusked. And we can get a lot of photographs. These can give us an idea of retrospective health of the animal and to also have a look at any scarring. And we can get a fecal sample. So here's where I can confess that this study, this talk today, is grounded on poop. <laughs> Poop is a gold mine for hormones. 
So hormones are our biological messengers. They float around the body and they have a really part, big part to pay in reproduction as well as other physiological processes, including our stress responses. Eventually, these molecules are eliminated from the body and excreted. And one of the main routes of excretion is through the gut. So they come out in poop. So that was my job. I have a very unique set of skills. <laughs> um, fecal research, on the whole, is generally termed non-invasive. And I will confess that I kind of pushed that definition a little bit. Because in order to do this, we couldn't wait around for the animal to poop. So I went in after it. <laughs> I'll spare you the details. Um, but basically, it's a pretty simple thing to do because these animals are hind gut fermenters. So a lot of their digester is done at the back. So a small veterinary lavage tube, and you can get a very small core. Now, I just needed a little bit. Three centimeters was enough. And by doing this, we were able to process 310 individuals in this population. And the data worked out great. So first off, one of the things I really wanted to do was to try and develop a pregnancy test for dugongs. So progesterone is the hormone responsible for maintaining gestation. And so what I found was that progesterone, which is on the y-axis, was significantly higher in the pregnant females. So in all of my charts, females are usually in pink, the immatures are probably lighter pink, and the males are in blue. And the pregnant females here are marked in the bright red box. So you can see they're drastically different from the other individuals. And this is on a log scale. So pregnant females have about 400 times more progesterone in their poop than other animals. The big bar in the middle is just adult females. So I don't know if those ones are pregnant or not. So we got the version of peeing on a stick for dugongs. On the pregnancy data, I also found that pregnant females tended to have teats that are five centimeters long or longer. Dugongs actually have teats, which is quite different to other marine mammals that actually have their mammary glands enclosed in slits. So with dugongs, you can actually see them. And yep, the males have them too. So they have small little nubbins. They don't become distended with the mammary glands like the females, but they do have nipples. So by using this technique, this test, I was able to look across the sampled population that we had and to tease out those that were pregnant and those that were non-pregnant. So you can see here, this is the distribution of the size distribution of all the animals that we sampled and those in red are pregnant females. Pregnant females started at a size of 253 centimeters was our smallest pregnant female. And most females were bigger than 260 centimeters. So that information there is quite drastic to that earlier data that I originally said from the tropics. There was one population that had the most precocious pregnant female and she was only 190 centimetres, or I think she was 205, sorry. Then moving on to the males. So as I said, the males have tusks. And we know that they erupt at sexual maturity. And some of the older females, they're thought to be older than 40 years of age, will actually have tusks as well. So all dugongs have these incisors. They just only erupt in the males and in the older females. So for the males, testosterone is the primary reproductive hormone for males. So I looked at testosterone across all males. And each of these little bars is a bin of size classes in groups of 10 centimetres. And the data showed that males were distinctively different at less than 240 centimetres. We then got a significant bump, in which case it rised, and then it rised again at 260 centimetres. That data matched nicely with our tusk data. So all Males under 240 centimetres had no tusks. So these were immature. 
The two small stars that you can see in that grouping there of the green, those were two males that had high testosterone. They technically didn't have tusks, but I could feel small little nubbins of the teeth starting to break through. So they're not too far off getting their maturity. <coughs> the next class had a mix of males with tusks and males without tusks, so they're sort of erupting. So this is sort of our pubital size class for males. And it goes from 240 centimetres to 260. At 260 centimetres, guaranteed, all males had tusks and the highest testosterone levels. So this here is our big mature breeders. But really interestingly was that 280 centimetres, those males tended to have slightly lower testosterone. So what we don't know is whether this correspond, corresponds to a decrease in fertility or some type of senescence. And the, the carcass data actually tends to match this as well. The smallest precocious male was 190 centimetres in the other tropical populations. So the dugongs of Moreton Bay are growing a lot longer, and technically that's also in time as well of age, before they reach maturity. Regarding seasonality, we looked at the male testosterone through the seasons and we got this one strong seasonal peak. So the other studies up in the tropics, they were a little bit mixed as to whether they were seasonal or not, but down in the south, definitely seasonal. And that peak was over the spring, so peaking in October and November. So from this data, I can say that it's likely that breeding will happen in mid to late October. And that's mostly based on from that peak in testosterone, it's about a month before spermatogenesis is at its peak. And now there's a handful of observations from Moreton Bay of mating behavior of dugongs, and that corresponds really nicely with our testosterone data. It also corresponds to when we see a peak in calf counts from the aerial surveys, and gestation is about 14 months, so working backwards. The next thing we wanted to look at was to have a look at some of the intergroup dynamics, because as a large herd, it's very hard to tease these out. In looking at this photo, you can see mum and calf pairs, but they're the only two you know, individuals that we can see sort of really interacting with one another. So using the testosterone data, I had a look at whether I saw the males in a herd or as a single individual. And what we found, if you just focus on the spring season, was that we got significant differences there. So green is the member of a group. So when we saw males in a group, they tended to have very low testosterone. But when we saw a male individual on its own during spring, it tended to have very high testosterone. So what we think is happening is that these mature, reproductively active males are roaming between female groups. And these groups are mostly comp composed of females. There are males in there, but they tend to have very low testosterone, except, and you can see on this bar that there's a number of stars rising above that group dynamic. So there are a handful of reproductively charged males in this group. So on the reproductive life history of Moreton Bay, we found that this population has the most protracted sexual maturity of any dugong population studied so far. They are strongly seasonal breeders, so spring is their time for mating. And we found that males have this st strategy where they move from group to group during reproductive times when they're in reproductive condition. So from here, we wanted to take our research to look at the stress physiology of dugongs. And dugongs pose a really interesting species to have a look at stress. First off, they live close to people, so they're prone to anthropogenic impacts. Sometimes they're dramatic, other times they're insidious and cumulative. So by looking at the physiology, we can actually start to get an insight into this before we see mortalities. They're a long-lived species, so any stressor is likely to have long-term impacts. 
They're the only herbivorous marine mammal, so they eat this low energy forage, which physiologically is fascinating. They tend to have a tropical subtropical distribution and Cyrenians in general, are, uh, they prefer warm waters. They don't have very good thermoregulation because even though they're quite fat looking, they actually don't have a very thick blubber layer. So thermoregulation is really important to them. And lastly, for the dugong, they have these tusks. Males have them, and we see evidence of rake marks on them, but nobody really understands it very well. We see it, but that's about it. So I really wanted to try to investigate that further. So I looked at the hormone, the group of hormones, the glucocorticoids, of which cortisol is one, and most people are familiar with that. So cortisol is one of the dominant stress responses. So measuring glucocorticoids, so you might see this in the slides come up as uh, GC. Looking at cortisol levels across the different uh, reproductive states, pregnant females come out as significantly higher. And pregnancy is a very energetically demanding uh, life history state, so that makes sense. But what we also found is that adult mature males also have very high cortisol levels, much higher than a mature female that isn't pregnant. In terms of the immature, the juvenile, the little guys, these guys have a seasonal change in their stress responses. So it peaks over winter and is lowest in summer. And we think that this is temperature related. Juvenile animals are particularly susceptible to cold weather, most because their smaller body size has a greater potential for heat loss. But in the bigger animals, what we saw was that males and females also had an increase in their stress during winter. But the most stressful time was actually during spring, and this was really significant for the males. And so we think that this is breeding related. So looking at the tusk rake marks. So you can see by this photo here, rake marks on dugongs are two parallel lines and it's exactly the distance between, between the tusks. Tusks in dugongs, most of the discussion has been that there is a feeding function because when dugongs feed, they don't just eat the leaves delicately off the top of the surface, they actually root through the seagrass meadow and they rip up the roots. So they get called sea cows, but they probably should be called sea pigs. So, but it's dimorphic. Males have the tusks, females don't. So that suggests that there might be a reproductive function involved here. And the fact that they erupt during sexual maturity adds to that. When people have seen mating events, and there's only a handful of people in the world that have seen dugongs mating, but when they do report it, they are very charismatic with the language that they use. So they describe fighting, lunging. So in these activities, it's likely that dugongs are sustaining these injuries. So I had a look at the number of tusk rake marks on an individual dugong and what is its cortisol or its stress level. And they were significantly correlated and positive. So the more tusk rake marks that an individual have tended to have higher stress levels. So to give you an idea of just how dramatic these are, that guy there with the highest, one of the highest counts of tusk rake marks is this animal here. So at certain times, they can be completely covered with these rake marks. So we think that this is happening during breeding. So I looked at tusk rake marks in males and females. Both of them had higher levels during the spring. And this, of course, corresponds to when the males have their peak in testosterone. Testosterone often drives aggressive behaviours in mammals. 
So what we think is happening is that males are delivering these tusk rake marks to females during copulation attempts, and males are sustaining tusk rake marks from other males during competition. So it's highly competitive, which coincides with why we saw these large mature males with very high testosterone at 260 centimetres. So it's very likely that a pubertal male, he may be mature, but until his tusks reach a certain size and his body reaches a certain size, then he may not have any successful matings. So with all this activity going on, it's stressful, but it also has to have a toll, likely, on the body. Because cortisol, what that does is it releases, it frees up your energy. So any fat stores that you have are likely to be depleted. So I looked at the body condition of adult males and females. And during summer and autumn, they're on the increase, leveled at winter, and then they declined during the spring. And the males declined a lot more than females. So this has a couple of um, reasons why this happens. So summer and fall, they're warmer months, and the seagrass is plenty. So body condition is recovering and stabilizing. When winter hits, it's cold, and the seagrass has a seasonal dieback. And this, of course, is when these animals are breeding. So the males are actively traveling between groups, and they're engaging in these fights and conflict interactions. So it's energetically expensive, and that is taking its toll on their body condition. But this is all normal. So for dugongs and their stress responses and their stress physiology, the years that I was working with this population were very normal. We saw normal seasonal patterns. So in the life of a dugong, they have physiological manifestations that are both related to the season, reproductive state, and their maturity, and it varies between the sexes. Pregnancy does take its toll on females, but breeding males also have a quite a stressful time. And spring is likely to be their most vulnerable time. During spring, there's increased interactions between one another, their body condition starts to fall and their stress responses naturally, because it's a natural response, is at their peak. And this is likely to be um, further compounded by the breeding movements and the seasonal changes. So, this is the baseline information that we acquired from the dugongs. So my PhD basically set up the tools to be able to understand what some of the insidious going ons are in the natural dugong system. So what we now have is baseline data on how this species copes. From here we can have a look at what our impacts as humans may have on this population. And that actually happened. Because as I was wrapping up my PhD, Southeast Queensland flooded in a very dramatic and catastrophic way. So this here is a picture of Moreton Bay. And so the entire Southeast catchment of Brisbane headed straight into the bay. And with it took a lot of urban pollution. Brisbane had flooded in 1974, but the debris that washed in from the 70s to now is completely different. We all are starting to live more and more on our waterways, houses closer to rivers, developments closer to rivers, and this took a lot of toll. And it all washed into Moreton Bay. So my supervisor, Janet Lanyon, and my project was part of a dugong health monitoring program but this work has set up the tools to be able to ongoing monitor this situation. Because a flood event like this is not likely, it's likely to have an insidious and cumulative effect on the dugongs. 
So the effects we'll see a long way down the track if we wait for mortalities. But if we look at the physiology right now and we look at the health of the animal right now, then we can potentially make some proactive choices. So now I'm here at the New England Aquarium and I'm very lucky to be a part of the Ocean Health Program under Ros Rowland's direction. And now we'd like to set up these same tools for the most urban serenia that there is in the world and that's the Florida manatee. So we want to set up these tools so that we can ongoing monitor this population and see some of those effects that aren't as dramatic as mortalities and we can catch that before there are mortalities. So it really is an early warning system. So that actually leads to the end of my talk. <laughs> But I have one message that I'd like you all to take home with you. And that is, next time you have a cup of coffee with your friends, have a conversation about the real mermaids. <laughs> um, so that question was about the reaction of the dugongs to people jumping on them. Um, each individual is different. So absolutely, um, we see some that will really put up a fight and the typical, if you ha have a fighter, the typical reaction is for them to basically um, flex backwards and forwards or roll. And it's that behaviour, that fight behaviour, particularly with the rolling, that if you were to put a net in there, they just wrap themselves up. So, so having people restrain, if, if there is any issue, it's let go and the animal can swim off freely. Teja was asking if there was any association between the testosterone level and the fight and I didn't find any any association with that. The question was about cross breeding dugongs and manatees. <laughs> so I guess it just happens in the public eye people just naturally cross breed them but yeah um, I mean in in the wild it's not going to happen because the species are so separated by oceans the Atlantic for the manatees and Indo-Pacific for dugongs. The question was about age structure. Yeah, really good question. So that is one thing that the necropsy work has a huge advantage over this work in that we, don't, we can't get ages because the age is based on the tusks. So you have to actually pull those out. But having said that though, um, we, we do have a handful of um, tusk specimens from Moreton Bay. And so I have been able to, to map out the growth rate of those tusks compared to, um, to the tropical populations. And it's fascinating. So even with the five individuals that we have, the growth rate of dugongs tends to be consistent across all populations studied so far up until about 220 centimetres. And then is like a pivot. And dugongs just keep growing and growing. So, oh, sorry, dugongs in Morton Bay keep growing and they end up being larger than the tropical, tropical dugongs. Whereas in the tropics, they, they tend to start flattening out. So, you know, from a population ecology perspective, what's really happening here is that the tropics have very lush seagrass beds and they're expansive. So the population has a lot of energy to feed. So it feeds very quickly and so it goes into reproduction a lot quicker. Whereas a subtropical population down in Moreton Bay where the seagrasses, they're not as diverse and they have the seasonal fluctuation. So the population is going to be limited by the, the energy that it can take in. So it, it just sort of keeps growing and then reproduction comes a little bit later because it's energy expensive. What is the population estimate of dugongs? So we don't really know around the world, but in Australia we think that there's about 70,000. And the biggest population is in the Torres Strait, so between the top end of Australia into Papua New Guinea, and that's thought to be about 15,000. So dugongs in northern Australia are our most prolific marine mammal species. There's more of them than there are dolphins. Yeah, so the question was about um, how residential are the dugongs? They're very residential. So um, the genetic work that's been done in Moreton Bay where we were working and the next nearest dugong population is ha in Harvey Bay, which is about four or five hours drive north of Brisbane. And we've been doing genetics work in there. And um, the genetic work is, is really quite cool because 
the, the techniques that we use for the Rodeo, we've actually been able to remove completely. And so the team's efficient enough that if you find a dugong, if you just have somebody leaning over the bow, then you can just quickly come up alongside, get a quick scrim, skin scrape, and then take off. So we have a lot of genetic information on dugongs. And between those two populations, which oceanographically speaking are not that far apart, there is actually no movement between, between there. The only movements that dugongs will make, particularly in Moreton Bay, is during the winter they will move outside of the bay to warmer oceanic waters and then they'll come back in. So they come back in to feed, but they'll spend a lot of time during winter out there. So it's a micro scale, but you know, in terms of other Serenians at their limit, because the Florida manatee is at its northern limit, and so those guys need to find warm water as well. So they don't go out to the oceans, they find the thermal springs of Florida. Asking about um, whether dugongs are friendly and, and their intelligence, um, no and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, if, you, if you come up alongside a dugong, it's going to flee. So a dolphin will come in occasionally if you're lucky in bow ride, dugongs will want nothing to do with you. And this is in stark contrast to if anyone's ever seen a Florida manatee. Uh, those animals have no idea about personal space. <laughs> but dugongs, they're out of there. And then intelligence wise, um, I mean, there's got to be some intelligence there, but yeah, it's, um, I mean, they're a big cow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the question was about like which dugong do you choose when um, you've got a large herd to choose from um, and is there any bias there in how you choose it? Um, and it's a really great question because we are very deliberate about which one we choose, mostly because we're in a speedboat. So in order to come up alongside this animal quickly and efficiently, you know, we do have to pick up the pace. And so we don't want to rip roar right through a dugong herd and disturb all of the animals. So we do take the ones on the edge and, and peel them off. But then having said that, um, us just being there will, you know, shift them around a little bit. So I don't think that there's any overall bias in the end. The dugongs themselves, as they graze, they sort of go in random patterns <coughs> anyway. So, but it's, it's a really great question. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, but I, and it's not just because of her accent and how awesome she is, but I could listen to Liz talk all day. So, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. There was one part of the expedition in Angola that was very, very difficult. It was, you know, the water was moving fast, the river was very narrow, it was very windy, everything was capsizing, it was cold and wet, and, you know, everybody, it was much harder than everyone was expect expecting. So everyone was really kind of bummed out and, and spirits were low. 